Dr. Zhivago Vok Zivago, 1. Russian, Dr. Zivago, IPA, Dr. Va, is a novel by Russian poet, author and composer Boris Pasternak, first published in 1957 in Italy. The novel is named after its protagonist, Yuri Zhivago, a physician and poet, and takes place between the Russian Revolution of 1905 and World War II. Boris Leonidovich Pasternak Pasternak, 1. Russian, Boris Leonidovich Pasternak, IPA, Brisland Fort Pisternak 2, the 10th of February, OS. The 29th of January, 1890, the 30th of May, 1960, was a Russian poet, novelist, composer, and literary translator. Composed in 1917, Pasternak's first book of poems, My Sister, Life, was published in Berlin in 1922 and soon became an important collection in the Russian language. Pasternak's translations of stage plays by Goethe, Schiller, Calderon de la Barca and Shakespeare remain very popular with Russian audiences. Pasternak was the author of Dr. Zhivago, 1957, a novel that takes place between the Russian Revolution of 1905 and the Second World War. Dr. Zhivago was rejected for publication in the USSR, but the manuscript was smuggled to Italy and was first published there in 1957. 3. Pasternak was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1958, an event that enraged the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which forced him to decline the prize. In 1989, Pasternak's son Yevgeny finally accepted the award on his father's behalf. Dr. Zhivago has been part of the main Russian school curriculum since 2003. The Russian Revolution of 1905, see also known as the First Russian Revolution, D began on the 22nd January 1905. A wave of mass political and social unrest then began to spread across the vast areas of the Russian Empire. The unrest was directed primarily against the Tsar, the nobility, and the ruling class. It included worker strikes, peasant unrest, and military mutinies. In response to the public pressure, Tsar Nicholas II was forced to go back on his earlier authoritarian stance and enact some reform issued in the October Manifesto. This took the form of establishing the State Duma, the multi-party system, and the Russian Constitution of 1906. Despite popular participation in the Duma, the parliament was unable to issue laws of its own, and frequently came into conflict with Nicholas. The Duma's power was limited and Nicholas continued to hold the ruling authority. Furthermore, he could dissolve the Duma, which he did three times in order to get rid of the opposition. 3. The 1905 revolution was set off by the international humiliation that resulted from the Russian defeat in the Russo-Japanese War, which ended in the same year. Calls for revolution were intensified by the growing realization by a variety of sectors of society of the need for reform. Politicians such as Sergei Witt had succeeded in partially industrializing Russia but failed to adequately meet the needs of the population. Tsar Nicholas II and the monarchy narrowly survived the revolution of 1905, but its events foreshadowed what was to come in the 1917 Russian Revolution. Many historians contend that the 1905 revolution set the stage for the 1917 Russian revolutions, which saw the monarchy abolished and the Tsar executed. Calls for radicalism were present in the 1905 revolution, but many of the revolutionaries who were in a position to lead were either in exile or in prison while it took place. The events in 1905 demonstrated the precarious position in which the Tsar found himself. As a result, Tsarist Russia did not undergo sufficient reform, which had a direct impact on the radical politics brewing in the Russian Empire. Although the radicals were still in the minority of the populace, their momentum was growing. Vladimir Lenin, a revolutionary himself, would later say that the revolution of 1905 was the great dress rehearsal, without which the victory of the October Revolution in 1917 would have been impossible. World War II B or the Second World War, the 1st of September 1939 to the 2nd of September 1945, was a global conflict between two coalitions, the Allies and the Axis powers. Nearly all of the world's countries, including all the great powers, participated, with many investing all available economic, industrial, and scientific capabilities in pursuit of total war, blurring the distinction between military and civilian resources. Tanks and aircraft played major roles, with the latter enabling the strategic bombing of population centers and delivery of the only two nuclear weapons ever used in war. World War II was the deadliest conflict in history, resulting in 70 to 85 million fatalities, more than half of which were civilians. Millions died in genocides, including the Holocaust of European Jews, and by massacres, starvation, and disease. Following the Allied powers' victory, 
Germany, Austria, Japan, and Korea were occupied, and war crimes tribunals were conducted against German and Japanese leaders. The causes of World War II included unresolved tensions in the aftermath of World War I and the rises of fascism in Europe and militarism in Japan, and it was preceded by events including the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, Spanish Civil War, outbreak of the Second Sino-Japanese War, and German annexations of Austria and the Sudetenland. World War II is generally considered to have begun on 1 September 1939, when Nazi Germany, under Adolf Hitler, invaded Poland. The United Kingdom and France declared war on Germany on 3 September. Under their Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Germany and the Soviet Union had partitioned Poland and marked out spheres of influence across Eastern Europe. In 1940, the Soviets annexed the Baltic states and parts of Finland and Romania. After the fall of France in June 1940, the war continued primarily between Germany and the British Empire, with campaigns in North and East Africa and the Balkans, the aerial battle of Britain and the Blitz of the UK, and the naval battle of the Atlantic. By mid-1941, through a series of campaigns and treaties, Germany occupied or controlled much of continental Europe and had formed the Axis alliance with Italy, Japan, and other countries. In June 1941, Germany led the European Axis in an invasion of the Soviet Union, opening the Eastern Front. Japan aimed to dominate East Asia and the Asia-Pacific, and by 1937 was at war with the Republic of China. In December 1941, Japan attacked American and British territories in Southeast Asia and the Central Pacific, including an attack on Pearl Harbor, which resulted in the United States and the United Kingdom declaring war against Japan. The European Axis powers declared war on the U.S. in solidarity. Japan soon conquered much of the Western Pacific, but its advances were halted in 1942 after its defeat in the naval battle of Midway. Germany and Italy were defeated in North Africa and at Stalingrad in the Soviet Union. Key setbacks in 1943, including German defeats on the Eastern Front, the Allied invasions of Sicily and the Italian mainland, and Allied offensives in the Pacific, cost the Axis powers their initiative and forced them into strategic retreat on all fronts. In 1944, the Western Allies invaded German-occupied France at Normandy, while the Soviet Union regained its territorial losses and pushed Germany and its allies westward. In 1944 and 1945, Japan suffered reversals in mainland Asia, while the Allies crippled the Japanese Navy and captured key Western Pacific islands. The war in Europe concluded with the liberation of German-occupied territories, the invasion of Germany by the Western Allies and the Soviet Union, culminating in the fall of Berlin to Soviet troops, Hitler's suicide, and the German unconditional surrender on 8 May 1945. Following the refusal of Japan to surrender on the terms of the Potsdam Declaration, the U.S. dropped the first atomic bombs on Hiroshima on 6 August and Nagasaki on 9 August. Faced with imminent invasion of the Japanese archipelago, the possibility of more atomic bombings, and the Soviet declaration of war against Japan and its invasion of Manchuria, Japan announced its unconditional surrender on 15 August and signed a surrender document on 2 September 1945, marking the end of the conflict. World War II changed the political alignment and social structure of the world, and it set the foundation of international relations for the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st century. The United Nations was established to foster international cooperation and prevent conflicts, with the victorious great powers, China, France, the Soviet Union, the UK, and the US, becoming the permanent members of its Security Council. The Soviet Union and the United States emerged as rival superpowers, setting the stage for the Cold War. In the wake of European devastation, the influence of its great powers waned, triggering the decolonization of Africa and Asia. Most countries whose industries had been damaged moved towards economic recovery and expansion. Owing to the author's critical stance on the October Revolution, Dr. Zhivago was refused publication in the USSR. At the instigation of Giangiacomo Feltrinelli, the manuscript was smuggled to Milan and published in 1957. Pasternak was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature the following year, an event that embarrassed and enraged the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. 2. The novel was made into a film by David Lean in 1965, and since then has twice been adapted for television, most recently as a miniseries for Russian TV in 2006. The novel Dr. Zhivago has been part of the Russian school curriculum since 2003, where it is read in 11th grade. 3. The plot of Dr. Zhivago is long and intricate. It can be difficult to follow for two reasons. Firstly, Pasternak employs many characters, who interact with each other throughout the book in unpredictable ways. 
Secondly, he frequently introduces a character by one of his her three names, then subsequently refers to that character by another of the three names or a nickname, without expressly stating that he is referring to the same character. Part 1. Edit. Imperial Russia, 1902. 4. The novel opens during a Russian Orthodox funeral liturgy, or Panikita, for Yuri's mother, Maria Nikolaevna Zhivago. Having long ago been abandoned by his father, Yuri is taken in by his maternal uncle, Nikolai Nikolaevich Videnyapin, a philosopher and former Orthodox priest who now works for the publisher of a progressive newspaper in a provincial capital on the Volga River. Yuri's father, Andrei Zhivago, was once a wealthy member of Moscow's merchant gentry, but has squandered the family's fortune in Siberia through debauchery and carousing. The next summer, Yuri, who is 11 years old, and Nikolai Nikolaevich travel to Duplianka, the estate of Lavrenty Mikhailovich Kalagrivov, a wealthy silk merchant. They are there not to visit Kalagrivov, who is abroad with his wife, but to visit a mutual friend, Ivan Ivanovich Voskoboynikov, an intellectual who lives in the steward's cottage. 5. Kalagrivov's daughters, Nadia, who is 15 years old, and Lipa, who is younger, are also living at the estate with a governess and servants. Inokinti Nika Dudorov, a 13-year-old boy who is the son of a convicted terrorist has been placed with Ivan Ivanovich by his mother and lives with him in the cottage. As Nikolai Nikolaevich and Ivan Ivanovich are strolling in the garden and discussing philosophy, they notice that a train passing in the distance has come to a stop in an unexpected place, indicating that something is wrong. On the train, an 11-year-old boy named Misha Grigorievich Gordon is traveling with his father. They have been on the train for three days. During that time, a kind man had given Misha small gifts and had talked for hours with his father, Grigory Osipovich Gordon. However, encouraged by his attorney, who was traveling with him, the man had become drunk. Eventually, the man had rushed to the vestibule of the moving train car, pushed aside the boy's father, opened the door and thrown himself out, killing himself. Misha's father had then pulled the emergency brake, bringing the train to a halt. The passengers disembark and view the corpse while the police are called. The deceased's lawyer stands near the body and blames the suicide on alcoholism. Part 2 The Russo-Japanese War was fought between the Japanese Empire and the Russian Empire during 1904 and 1905 over rival imperial ambitions in Manchuria and the Korean Empire. Four the major theaters of military operations were in the Laodong Peninsula and Mukden in southern Manchuria, the Yellow Sea and the Sea of Japan. Russia sought a warm water port on the Pacific Ocean both for its navy and for maritime trade. Vladivostok remained ice-free and operational only during the summer. Port Arthur, a naval base in Laodong province leased to Russia by the Qing dynasty of China from 1897, was operational year-round. Russia had pursued an expansionist policy east of the Urals, in Siberia and the Far East, since the reign of Ivan the Terrible in the 16th century. 5. Since the end of the First Sino-Japanese War in 1895, Japan had feared Russian encroachment would interfere with its plans to establish a sphere of influence in Korea and Manchuria. Seeing Russia as a rival, Japan offered to recognize Russian dominance in Manchuria in exchange for recognition of the Korean Empire as being within the Japanese sphere of influence. Russia refused and demanded the establishment of a neutral buffer zone between Russia and Japan in Korea, north of the 39th parallel. The Imperial Japanese government perceived this as obstructing their plans for expansion into mainland Asia and chose to go to war. After negotiations broke down in 1904, the Imperial Japanese Navy opened hostilities in a surprise attack on the Russian Eastern Fleet at Port Arthur, China, on 9 February OS. The 27th of January, 1904. The Russian Empire responded by declaring war on Japan. Although Russia suffered a number of defeats, Emperor Nicholas II remained convinced that Russia could still win if it fought on, he chose to remain engaged in the war and await the outcomes of key naval battles. As hope of victory dissipated, he continued the war to preserve the dignity of Russia by averting a humiliating peace. Russia ignored Japan's willingness early on to agree to an armistice and rejected the idea of bringing the dispute to the permanent court of arbitration at The Hague. After the decisive naval battle of Tsushima, the war was concluded with the Treaty of Portsmouth, the 5th of September OS. The 23rd of August 1905 mediated by U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. The complete victory of the Japanese military surprised international observers and transformed the balance of power in both East Asia and Europe, resulting in Japan's emergence as a great power and a decline in the Russian Empire's prestige and influence in Europe.
Russia's incurrence of substantial casualties and losses for a cause that resulted in humiliating defeat contributed to growing domestic unrest, which culminated in the 1905 Russian Revolution and severely damaged the prestige of the Russian autocracy. During the Russo-Japanese War 1904-1905, Amalia Karlovna Gishard arrives in Moscow from the Urals with her two children, Rodion Radia, and Larissa Lara. Gishard's late husband was a Belgian who had been working as an engineer for the railroad and had been friends with Viktor Ippolitovich Komarovsky, a lawyer and cold-blooded businessman. Komarovsky sets them up in rooms at the Sidi Montenegro Hotel, enrolls Rodion in the cadet corps and enrolls Lara in a girls' high school. The girls' school is the same school that Nadia Kalagrivov attends. On Komarovsky's advice, Amalia invests in a small dress shop. Amalia and her children live at the Montenegro for about a month before moving into the apartment over the dress shop. Despite an ongoing affair with Amalia, Komarovsky begins to groom Lara behind her mother's back. In early October, the workers of the Moscow Brest Railroad line go on strike. The foreman of the station is Pavel Ferapontovich Antipov. His friend Kiprian Salievich Tiverzin is called into one of the railroad workshops and stops a workman from beating his apprentice, whose name is Osip Yusupka Gimazetdinovich Galulin. The police arrest Pavel Ferapontovich for his role in the strike. Pavel Ferapontovich's boy, Petulia or Pasha or Pashka Pavlovich Antipov, comes to live with Tiverzin and his mother. Tiverzin's mother and Petulia attend a demonstration which is attacked by dragoons, but they survive and return home. As the protesters flee the dragoons, Nikolai Nikolaevich, Yuri's uncle, is standing inside a Moscow apartment, at the window, watching the people flee. Some time ago, he moved from the Volga region to Petersburg, and at the same time moved Yuri to Moscow to live at the Gromyko household. Nikolai Nikolaevich had then come to Moscow from Petersburg earlier in the fall, and is staying with the S. Ventitskys, who were distant relations. The Gromyko household consists of Alexander Alexandrovich Gromyko, his wife Anna Ivanovna, and his bachelor brother Nikolai Alexandrovich. Anna is the daughter of a wealthy steel magnate, now deceased, from the Uriadin region in the Urals. They have a daughter Tanya. In January 1906, the Gromikos host a chamber music recital at their home one night. One of the performers is a cellist who is a friend of Amalia's, and her next-door neighbor at the Montenegro. Six midway through the performance, the cellist is recalled to the Montenegro because, he is told, someone there is dying. Alexander Alexandrovich, Yuri and Misha come along with the cellist. At the Montenegro, the boys stand in a public corridor outside one of the rooms, seven, embarrassed, while Amalia, who has taken poison, is treated with an emetic. Eventually, they are shooed into the room by the boarding house employees who are using the corridor. The boys are assured that Amalia is out of danger and, once inside the room, see her, half-naked and sweaty, talking with the cellist, she tells him that she had, suspicions, but, fortunately it all turned out to be foolishness. The boys then notice, in a dark part of the room, a girl, it is Lara, asleep on a chair. Unexpectedly, Komarovsky emerges from behind a curtain and brings a lamp to the table next to Lara's chair. The light wakes her up and she, unaware that Yuri and Misha are watching, shares a private moment with Komarovsky, as if he were a puppeteer and she a puppet, obedient to the movements of his hand. They exchange conspiratorial glances, pleased that their secret was not discovered and that Amalia did not die. This is the first time Yuri sees Lara, and he is fascinated by the scene. Misha then whispers to Yuri that the man he is watching is the same one who got his father drunk on the train shortly before his father's suicide. Part 3. In November 1911, Anna Ivanovna Gromyko becomes seriously ill with pneumonia. At this time, Yuri, Misha, and Tanya are studying to be a doctor, philologist, and lawyer respectively. Yuri learns that his father had a child, a boy named Yevgraf, by Princess Stolbunova Enrizi. The narrative returns to the spring of 1906. Lara is increasingly tormented by Komarovsky's control over her, which has now been going on for six months. In order to get away from him, she asks her classmate and friend Nadia Laurentovna Kalagrivov to help her find work as a tutor. Nadia says she can work for Nadia's own family because her parents happen to be looking for a tutor for her sister Lipa. Lara spends more than three years working as a governess for the Kalagrivivs. Lara admires the Kalagrivivs, and they love her as if she were their own child. In her fourth year with the Kalagrivivs, Lara is visited by her brother Radia. He needs 700 rubles to cover a debt. Lara says she will try to get the money, and in exchange demands Radia's cadet revolver along with some cartridges. She obtains the money from Kalagrivov. She does not pay the money back, 
because she uses her wages to help support her boyfriend Pasha Antipov, see above, and his father, who lives in exile without Pasha's knowledge. We move forward to 1911. Lara visits the Kalagrivov's country estate with them for the last time. She is becoming discontented with her situation, but she enjoys the pastimes of the estate anyway, and she becomes an excellent shot with Radia's revolver. When she and the family return to Moscow, her discontent grows. Around Christmas time, she resolves to part from the Kalagrivovs, and to ask Komarovsky for the money necessary to do that. She plans to kill him with Radia's revolver should he refuse her. On the 27th of December, the date of the Sventitsky's Christmas party, she goes to Komarovsky's home but is informed that he is at a Christmas party. She gets the address of the party and starts toward it, but relents and pays Pasha a visit instead. She tells him that they should get married right away, and he agrees. At the same moment that Lara and Pasha are having this discussion, Yuri and Tanya are passing by Pasha's apartment in the street. On their way to the S. Ventitsky's, they arrive at the party and enjoy the festivities. Later, Lara arrives at the party. She knows no one there other than Komarovsky, and is not dressed for a ball. She tries to get Komarovsky to notice her, but he is playing cards and either does not notice her or pretends not to. Through some quick inferences, she realizes that one of the men playing cards with Komarovsky is Kornikov, a prosecutor of the Moscow court. He prosecuted a group of railway workers that included Kiprian Tiverzin, Pasha's foster father. 8. Later, while Yuri and Tanya are dancing, a shot rings out. There is a great commotion and it is discovered that Lara has shot Kornikov, not Komarovsky, and Kornikov has received only a minor wound. Lara has fainted and is being dragged by some guests to a chair, Yuri recognizes her with amazement. Yuri goes to render medical attention to Lara but then changes course to Kornikov because he is the nominal victim. He pronounces Kornikov's wound to be, a trifle, and is about to tend to Lara when misses. S. Ventitsky and Tanya urgently tell him that he must return home because something was not right with Anna Ivanovna. When Yuri and Tanya return home, they find that Anna Ivanovna has died. Part 4 Edit. Komarovsky uses his political connections to shield Lara from prosecution. Lara and Pasha marry, graduate from university, and depart by train for Uriaden. The narrative moves to the second autumn of the First World War. Yuri has married Tanya and is working as a doctor at a hospital in Moscow. Tanya gives birth to their first child, a son. Back in Uriaden, the Antipovs also have their first child, a girl named Katenka. Although he loves Lara deeply, Pasha feels increasingly stifled by her love for him. In order to escape, he volunteers for the Imperial Russian Army. Lara starts to work as a teacher in Uriaden. Sometime later, she leaves Uriaden and goes to a town in Galicia, to look for Pasha. The town happens to be where Yuri is now working as a military doctor. Elsewhere, Lt. Antipov is taken prisoner by the Austro-Hungarian Army, but is erroneously declared missing in action. Wounded by artillery fire, Yuri is sent to a battlefield hospital in the town of Meliuzivo, where Lara is his nurse. Gadolin, the apprentice who was beaten in Part 2, is also in Lara's ward, recovering from injuries. He is now a lieutenant in Pasha's unit, he informs Lara that Pasha is alive, but she doubts him. Lara gets to know Yuri better but is not impressed with him. At the very end of this part, it is announced in the hospital that there has been a revolution. Part 5 after his recovery, Zhivago stays on at the hospital as a physician. This puts him at close quarters with Lara. They are both, along with Galulin, trying to get permission to leave and return to their homes. In Meliuzivo, a newly arrived commissar for the provisional government, whose name is Gintz, is informed that a local military unit has deserted and is camped in a nearby cleared forest. Gintz decides to accompany a troop of Cossacks who have been summoned to surround and disarm the deserters. He believes he can appeal to the deserters, Pridas, soldiers in the world's first revolutionary army. A train of mounted Cossacks arrives and the Cossacks quickly surround the deserters. Gintz enters the circle of horsemen and makes a speech to the deserters. His speech backfires so badly that the Cossacks who are there to support him gradually sheath. Their sabers, dismount and start to fraternize with the deserters. The Cossack officers advise Gintz to flee. He does, but he is pursued by the deserters and brutally murdered by them at the railroad station. Shortly before he leaves, Yuri says goodbye to Lara. He starts by expressing his excitement over the fact that, the roof over the whole of Russia has been torn off, and we and all the people find ourselves under the open sky, with true freedom for the first time. Despite himself, 
He then starts to clumsily tell Lara that he has feelings for her. Lara stops him and they part. A week later, they leave by different trains, she to Yuriaden and he to Moscow. On the train to Moscow, Yuri reflects on how different the world has become, and on his, honest trying with all his might not to love Lara. Part 6-9 The October Revolution, A, also known as the Great October Socialist Revolution, B, in Soviet historiography, October coup, 5, 6 Bolshevik coup, 6 or Bolshevik Revolution, 7, 8 was a revolution in Russia led by the Bolshevik party of Vladimir Lenin that was a key moment in the larger Russian Revolution of 1917-1923. It was the second revolutionary change of government in Russia in 1917. It took place through an armed insurrection in Petrograd, now St. Petersburg, on 7 November 1917 OS. The 25th of October. It was the precipitating event of the Russian Civil War. The initial stage of the October Revolution which involved the assault on Petrograd occurred largely without any human casualties. 9, 10, 11. The October Revolution followed and capitalized on the February Revolution earlier that year, which led to the abdication of Nicholas II and the creation of a provisional government. The provisional government, led by Alexander Kerensky, had taken power after Grand Duke Michael, the younger brother of Nicholas II, declined to take power. During this time, urban workers began to organize into councils Soviets, wherein revolutionaries criticized the provisional government and its actions. The provisional government remained unpopular, especially because it was continuing to fight in World War I, and had ruled with an iron fist throughout the summer including killing hundreds of protesters in the July days. Events came to a head in the fall as the directorate, led by the left-wing party of socialist revolutionaries SRs controlled the government. The far-left Bolsheviks were deeply unhappy with the government, and began spreading calls for a military uprising. On 10 October 1917, OS. The 23rd of October, NS the Petrograd Soviet, led by Trotsky, voted to back a military uprising. On 24 October, OS. 6 November, NS the government shut down numerous newspapers and closed the city of Petrograd in an attempt to forestall the revolution, minor armed skirmishes broke out. The next day a full-scale uprising erupted as a fleet of Bolshevik sailors entered the harbor and tens of thousands of soldiers rose up in support of the Bolsheviks. Bolshevik Red Guards forces under the Military Revolutionary Committee began the occupation of government buildings on 25 October OS. 7 November, NS 1917. The following day, the Winter Palace, the seat of the provisional government located in Petrograd, then capital of Russia, was captured. As the revolution was not universally recognized, the country descended into the Russian Civil War, which would last until 1923 and ultimately lead to the creation of the Soviet Union in late 1922. The historiography of the event has varied. The victorious Soviet Union viewed it as a validation of their ideology, and the triumph of the worker over capitalism. During Soviet times, Revolution Day was a national holiday, marking its importance in the country's founding story. On the other hand, the Western Allies saw it as a totalitarian coup, which used the Democratic Soviet councils only until they were no longer useful. The event inspired many cultural works, and ignited communist movements across Europe and globally. Many Marxist-Leninist parties around the world celebrate October Revolution Day. The Russian Civil War A was a multi-party civil war in the former Russian Empire sparked by the overthrowing of the Social Democratic Russian Provisional Government in the October Revolution, as many factions vied to determine Russia's political future. It resulted in the formation of the Russian Socialist Federative Soviet Republic and later the Soviet Union in most of its territory. Its finale marked the end of the Russian Revolution, which was one of the key events of the 20th century. The Russian monarchy ended with the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II during the February Revolution, and Russia was in a state of political flux. A tense summer culminated in the October Revolution, where the Bolsheviks overthrew the provisional government of the new Russian Republic. Bolshevik seizure of power was not universally accepted, and the country descended into civil war. The two largest combatants were the Red Army, fighting for the establishment of a Bolshevik-led socialist state headed by Vladimir Lenin, and the loosely allied forces known as the White Army, which functioned as a political big tent for right and left-wing opposition to Bolshevik rule. In addition, rival militant socialists, notably the Ukrainian anarchists of the Moknovshina and left socialist revolutionaries, were involved in conflict against the Bolsheviks. They, as well as non-ideological Green Armies, opposed the Bolsheviks, the Whites and the foreign interventionists.
Eleven thirteen foreign nations intervened against the Red Army, notably the Allied intervention, whose primary goal was re-establishing the Eastern Front of World War I. Three foreign nations of the Central Powers also intervened, rivaling the Allied intervention with the main goal of retaining the territory they had received in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Soviet Russia. The Bolsheviks initially consolidated control over most of the former empire. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk was an emergency peace with the German Empire, who had captured vast swathes of the Russian territory during the chaos of the revolution. In May 1918, the Czechoslovak Legion in Russia revolted in Siberia. In reaction, the Allies began their North Russian and Siberian interventions. That, combined with the creation of the provisional all-Russian government, saw the reduction of Bolshevik-controlled territory to most of European Russia and parts of Central Asia. In 1919, the White Army launched several offensives from the east in March, the south in July, and west in October. The advances were later checked by the Eastern Front counteroffensive, the Southern Front counteroffensive, and the defeat of the Northwestern Army. By 1919, the White Armies were in retreat and by the start of 1920 were defeated on all three fronts. 12. Although the Bolsheviks were victorious, the territorial extent of the Russian state had been reduced, for many non-Russian ethnic groups had used the disarray to push for national independence. 13. In March 1921, during a related war against Poland, the Peace of Riga was signed, splitting disputed territories in Belarus and Ukraine between the Republic of Poland and Soviet Russia. Soviet Russia sought to reconquer all newly independent nations of the former empire, although their success was limited. Estonia, Finland, Latvia, and Lithuania all repelled Soviet invasions, while Ukraine, Belarus, as a result of the Polish-Soviet War, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia were occupied by the Red Army. 1415 By 1921, Soviet Russia had defeated the Ukrainian national movements and occupied the Caucasus, although anti-Bolshevik uprisings in Central Asia lasted until the late 1920s. 16. The armies under Kolchak were eventually forced on a mass retreat eastward. Bolshevik forces advanced east, despite encountering resistance in Chita, Yakut and Mongolia. Soon the Red Army split the Don and Volunteer Armies, forcing evacuations in Novorossiysk in March and Crimea in November 1920. After that, anti-Bolshevik resistance was sporadic for several years until the capture of Vladivostok in October 1922, but continued on with the Muslim Basmashi movement in Central Asia and Khabarovsk Krai until 1934. There were an estimated 7 to 12 million casualties during the war, mostly civilians. Following the October Revolution and the subsequent Russian Civil War, Yuri and his family decide to flee by train to Tanya's family's former estate called Verikino, located near the town of Uryadin in the Ural Mountains. During the journey, he has an encounter with Army Commissar Strelnikov, the executioner, a fearsome commander who summarily executes both captured whites and many civilians. Yuri and his family settle in an abandoned house on the estate. Over the winter, they read books to each other and Yuri writes poetry and journal entries. Spring comes and the family prepares for farm work. Yuri visits Yuriaden to use the public library, and during one of these visits sees Lara at the library. He decides to talk with her, but finishes up some work first, and when he looks up she is gone. He gets her home address from a request slip she had given the librarian. On another visit to town, he visits her at her apartment, which she shares with her daughter. She informs him that Strelnikov is indeed Pasha, her husband. During one of Yuri's subsequent visits to Uriadin they consummate their relationship. They meet at her apartment regularly for more than two months, but then Yuri, while returning from one of their trysts to his house on the estate, is abducted by men loyal to Liberius, commander of the Forest Brotherhood, the Bolshevik guerrilla band. Parts 10-13 to Liberius is a dedicated old Bolshevik and highly effective leader of his men. However, Liberius is also a cocaine addict, loud-mouthed and narcissistic. He repeatedly bores Yuri with his long-winded lectures about the glories of socialism and the inevitability of its victory. Yuri spends more than two years with Liberius and his partisans, then finally manages to escape. After a grueling journey back to Uriadin, made largely on foot, Yuri goes into town to see Lara first, rather than to Verikino to see his family. In town, he learns that his wife, children, and father-in-law fled the estate and returned to Moscow. From Lara, he learns that Tanya delivered a daughter after he left. Lara assisted at the birth and she and Tanya became close friends. Yuri gets a job and stays with Lara and her daughter for a few months. 
One of Lara's friends, Sima Tunseva, gives her a lengthy sermon on Mary Magdalene in the style of Tolstoy. Eventually, a townsman delivers a letter to Yuri from Tanya, which Tanya wrote five months before and which has passed through innumerable hands to reach Yuri. In the letter, Tanya informs him that she, the children, and her father are being deported, probably to Paris. She says, the whole trouble is that I love you and you do not love me, and, we will never, ever see each other again. When Yuri finishes reading the letter, he has chest pains and faints. Part 14 In the dead of winter, Lara and Yuri move back to the estate at Verikino where there are literal wolves at the door every night. Komarovsky reappears. Having used his influence within the CPSU, Komarovsky has been appointed Minister of Justice of the Far Eastern Republic, a Soviet puppet state in Siberia. He offers to smuggle Yuri and Lara outside Soviet soil. They initially refuse, but Komarovsky states, falsely, that Pasha Antipov is dead, having fallen from favor with the party. Stating that this will place Lara in the Cheka's crosshairs, he persuades Yuri that it is in her best interests to leave for the East. Yuri convinces Lara to go with Komarovsky, telling her that he will follow her shortly. Meanwhile, the hunted General Strelnikov, Pasha, returns for Lara. Lara, however, has already left with Komarovsky. After expressing regret over the pain he has caused his country and loved ones, Pasha commits suicide. Yuri finds his body the following morning. Part 15. Edit. After returning to Moscow, Zhivago's health declines, he marries another woman, Marina, and fathers two children with her. He also plans numerous writing projects which he never finishes. Yuri leaves his new family and his friends to live alone in Moscow and work on his writing. However, after living on his own for a short time, he dies of a heart attack while riding the tram. Meanwhile, Lara returns to Russia to learn of her dead husband and ends up attending Yuri Zhivago's funeral. She persuades Yuri's half-brother, who is now NKVD General Yevgraf Zhivago, to assist her in her search for a daughter that she had conceived with Yuri, but had abandoned in the Urals. Ultimately, however, Lara disappears, believed arrested during Joseph Stalin's Great Purge and dying in the Gulag, a nameless number on a list that was later misplaced. Epilogue. Edit. During World War II, Zhivago's old friends Nika Dudorov and Misha Gordon meet up. One of their discussions revolves around a local laundress named Tanya, a Besprizornaya, or war orphan, and her resemblance to both Yuri and Lara. Tanya tells both men of the difficult childhood she has had due to her mother abandoning her in order to marry Komarovsky. Much later, the two men meet over the first edition of Yuri Zhivago's poems. Themes. Edit. Loneliness. Edit. In the shadow of all this grand political change, we see that everything is governed by the basic human longing for companionship. Zhivago and Pasha, in love with the same woman, both traverse Russia in these volatile times in search of such stability. They are both involved in nearly every level of the tumultuous times that Russia faced in the first half of the 20th century, yet the common theme and the motivating force behind all their movement is a want of a steady home life. When we first meet Zhivago he is being torn away from everything he knows. He is sobbing and standing on the grave of his mother. We bear witness to the moment all stability is destroyed in his life and the rest of the novel is his attempts to recreate the security stolen from him at such a young age. After the loss of his mother, Zhivago develops a longing for what Freud called the maternal object, feminine love and affection in his later romantic relationships with women. 38. His first marriage, to Tanya, is not one born of passion but from friendship. In a way, Tanya takes on the role of the mother figure that Zhivago always sought but lacked. This, however, was not a romantic tie, while he feels loyal to her throughout his life, he never could find true happiness with her, for their relationship lacks the fervor that was integral to his relationship to Lara. 39. Disillusionment with Revolutionary Ideology. Edit. In the beginning of the novel, between the 1905 Russian Revolution and World War I, characters freely debate different philosophical and political ideas including Marxism, but after the revolution and the state-enforced terror of war communism, Zhivago and others cease to talk politics. Zhivago, a stubborn non-conformist, rants within himself at the blindness of revolutionary propaganda and grows exasperated with the conformity and transparency of the hypocrisy of his friends who adhere to the prevailing dogma. Zhivago's mental and even physical health crumble under the strain of a constant, systematic dissembling, by which citizens, rather than thinking for themselves, are expected to show themselves day by day contrary to what they feel. In the epilogue, in which Russia is enveloped in World War II, 
The characters Dudorov and Gordon discuss how the war united Russia against a real enemy, which was better than the preceding days of the Great Purge when Russians were turned against one another by the deadly, artificial ideology of totalitarianism. This reflects Pasternak's hope that the trials of the Great Patriotic War would, to quote translator Richard Pavir, lead to the final liberation that had been the promise of the Russian Revolution from the beginning. 40. Coincidence and the Unpredictability of Reality in contrast to the socialist realism that was imposed as the official artistic style of the Soviet Union, Pasternak's novel relies heavily on unbelievable coincidences, a reliance for which the plot was criticized. 40. Pasternak uses the frequently intersecting paths of his cast of characters not only to tell several different people's stories over the decades-long course of the novel, but also to emphasize the chaotic, unpredictable nature of the time period in which it is set, and of reality more generally. In the end, immediately before his death, Zhivago has a revelation of, several existences developing side by side, moving next to each other at different speeds, and about one person's fate getting ahead of another's in life, and who outlives whom. This reflects the crisscrossing journeys of characters over decades, and represents the capricious chance governing their lives. Edmund Wilson wrote of the novel, Dr. Zhivago will, I believe, come to stand as one of the great events in man's literary and moral history. 41 v. S. Pritchett wrote in The New Statesman that the novel is t he first work of genius to come out of Russia since the revolution. 42. When the novel came out in Italian, Anders Osterling, the then permanent secretary of the Swedish Academy which awards the Nobel Prize in Literature, wrote in January 1958, a strong patriotic accent comes through, but with no trace of empty propaganda. With its abundant documentation, its intense local color and its psychological frankness, this work bears convincing witness to the fact that the creative faculty in literature is in no sense extinct in Russia. It is hard to believe that the Soviet authorities might seriously envisage forbidding its publication in the land of its birth. 43. Some literary critics found that there was no real plot to the novel, that its chronology was confused, that the main characters were oddly effaced, that the author relied far too much on contrived coincidences. 40. Vladimir Nabokov, who had celebrated Pasternak's books of poetry as works of pure, unbridled genius, however, considered the novel to be a sorry thing, clumsy, trite and melodramatic, with stock situations, voluptuous lawyers, unbelievable girls, romantic robbers and trite coincidences. 44. On the other hand, some critics praised it for being things that, in the opinion of translator Richard Pavir, it was never meant to be a moving love story, or a lyrical biography of a poet in which the individual is set against the grim realities of Soviet life. 40. Pasternak defended the numerous coincidences in the plot, saying that they are traits to characterize that somewhat willful, free, fanciful flow of reality. 45. In response to criticism in the West of his novel's characters and coincidences, Pasternak wrote to Stephen Spender. Whatever the cause, reality has been for me like a sudden, unexpected arrival that is intensely welcome. I have always tried to reproduce this sense of being sent, of being launched, there is an effort in my novels to represent the whole sequence facts, beings, happenings, as a great moving entity, a developing, passing, rolling, rushing inspiration. As if reality itself had freedom of choice. Hence the reproach that my characters were insufficiently realized. Rather than delineate, I was trying to efface them. Hence the frank arbitrariness of the, coincidences. Here I wanted to show the unrestrained freedom of life, its very verisimilitude contiguous with improbability. 46. Influences and Inspiration Edit The novel has been described as partly autobiographical, nine or autobiographical, partially in the external but mostly in internal sense, ten containing autobiographical elements, some of its characters were inspired by people close to the author. For example, Pasternak's mistress Olga Ivanskaya served as the inspiration for the character of Lara, and on one of his letters, the author wrote that Ivanskaya was, Lara in my book, 11 other characters of the novel received the features of the author himself. In the 1930s, Pasternak wrote works with autobiographical features on the theme of the revolution, like Spektorsky, the plot of which is centered around the poet, with his attitude towards the historical events similar to the one experienced by Pasternak, 10, and the novella The Last Summer. Both works could be the early attempts to produce a work based on the author's experience of the revolution and the civil war, by its concept similar to the one of Dr. Zhivago. 12. Efim Etkin believed that one of the sources of literary influence on Dr. Zhivago was the novel The Life of Klim Samgin by Maxim Gorky. 
Etkind wrote that it could serve as a negative background to Zhivago, and that Dr. Zhivago may be a response to Gorky's novel. 13. Pasternak expressed his admiration for this novel in a letter to Gorky in 1927. 14. Soviet censorship. Edit. Although it contains passages written in the 1910s and 1920s, Dr. Zhivago was not completed until 1955. The novel was submitted to the literary journal Novi Mir, Novi Mir in 1956. However, the editors rejected Pasternak's novel because of its implicit rejection of socialist realism. 1-5 The author, like Zhivago, showed more concern for the welfare of individuals than for the welfare of society. Soviet censors construed some passages as anti-Soviet. Citation needed they also objected to Pasternak's subtle criticisms of Stalinism, collectivization, the Great Purge, and the Gulag. Citation needed.